Welcome to CS320, Chapter 16. In this chapter, we're going to talk about non-context-free languages. And our first non-context-free language we're going to look at is A to the N, B to the N, A to the N. Now, how do we know this is not context-free? Let's say that your boss or your professor or somebody said, prove or give me a context-free grammar for this language. Now, you could keep trying to create a grammar for it, and maybe you just might be thinking, ah, I'm just not smart enough to create a grammar for this, or maybe this is not context-free. Um, but how would we know? And just like with regular languages, there's a pumping lemma theorem that we can use to help us prove that languages are not context-free. Now, you might be asking, well, how do I prove that a language is context-free? Well, with that, you just write down the grammar or create a push down automata that defines that language. If you could define it with a context-free grammar, then it's a context-free language. So that part is uh, hopefully fairly easy as long as you could come up with that grammar. But knowing that this language is not context-free, there's not gonna be a way to define, to write down a grammar that will define this language. So instead you can write down a proof using this pumping lemma theorem that will show that this language is not context-free. Now, much like the pumping lemma theorem for regular languages, if um, this uh, has an implication, if a language is context-free, then we can pump it. So what, how we're gonna use it is prove that we can't pump it, so therefore it must not be context-free. So hopefully you remember your logic uh, from your discrete math, your uh, predicate or propositional logic, where um, if we have this and we have that, then that implies that this cannot be true because if this is true, this has to be true. So if this is not true, then we know that this cannot be true as well. So that's this part that if we have a context-free grammar, in Chomsky's normal form, so we're going to use Chomsky's normal form as part of this. If we have a grammar, then we have to pump it. Now, if you notice, instead of breaking it into three strings, we need to break it into five different substrings. Now, we don't have to use all five of them. We only have to make sure that x is not null, and it says that right here. And then one of the v's or the y's is not null. Now, before you, we continue, let's talk about this with P live productions. If you remember, a live production is a non-terminal goes to two non-terminals. So when you write down the context-free grammar in Chomsky's normal form, it'll have a certain number of live productions. And all we have to do is take words that are larger than two to the P, and, be, and all of those words, we have to be able to pump it if the language is context-free. So we're trying to prove that a language is not context-free, so we don't have a language with P live productions. So what number do we use for P? And the good thing about that is we could kind of ignore the P. All we're gonna do is kind of show in a general case, there's no way to break up strings in the language, be able to pump them, and keep those uh, after we pump it or make copies of the V and the Y. And you're gonna make multiple copies of them. And as we make copies though, of the Vs and the Ys, it generates words that are not in the language. So we can kind of basically ignore this P and the length right here, which makes our proofs a lot easier. Now these are in here um, because this theorem right here does need to be proved. And the proof for this is maybe a little complex, and I'm not going to cover it. But you can read the proof in your book. The proof uh, required, in order to prove it, we require this to be in there. But since we're just talking about hypothetical context-free grammars that we know do not exist, there's no way that we can count how many live productions are in there and come up with the length of the words that we need to use. All we need to do is say, Here's words in the language. There's no way that we can break it up into 
these five substrings make copies of the V and the Y to generate more words in our language. And that allows us to get around worrying about this P part right here. So let's go ahead and uh, at least discuss a proof for this language right here. And let's go ahead and come up with a word in that language. We'll just use uh, n equal to three. So three A's, three B's, and another three A's. All right, now let's talk about how we might break this up into five separate substrings, U, V, X, Y, and Z. Now X needs to contain something and the V and the Y also have to have, at least one of them has to have something. So we could have this be X and this be Y, or we can move this over to X and this be V, or we can have a Y and a V with an X in between it. Um, we could leave U and Z as null, or we can have them take some of the letters at the beginning and end of our word. But no matter what, so there's lots of little ways that we can break this apart. But all we need to do is kind of group all the ways into a few different groups and discuss that why when um, that those are all the different ways that those groups represent all the different ways we could break this up into five substrings, and that no matter what, none of those groups will lead to generating more words that happen to be in the language. Now, in order for a word to be in this language, it has to have some A's, then some B's, and then some A's. The number of A's, B's, and the following trailing A's has to be equal. So let's go ahead and come up with some uh, different groups of ways that we could break this thing up into, um, into five separate substrings. All right, so here are... Um, here's one group, and it, I'm gonna. This group is gonna be fairly broad, where V and Y contain just one uh, solid letter, either all A's or all B's. Now they don't have to contain the same solid letter. They could if they wanted to, um, but V is made up of only one letter, and Y is made up of only one letter. And that encompasses a lot of groupings. The V contains some A's here and the Y contains some B's. The V contains some A's and the Y contains some A's. The V contains some A's, the Y contains some A's over there. Um, anyways, whatever we choose for V has solid A's and uh, whatever we choose for Y could have solid B's, but they're just solid letters. Now let's see what happens when we start making copies of the V and the Y. So if the V contains A's from this group and the Y contains B's, then these A's can't keep up with the same number. So um, if the V here contains solid A's and the Y contains solid A's from that side, then the B's can't keep up. And if we uh, have the V and the Y, then these A's can't keep up. Notice there has to be something that increases the number of A's, B's, and A's. So we really need three letters, not two. We need uh, something, we need three groups so that we could keep all these A's and B's the same number. All right, let's come up with our second group. And this second group is very broad as well. Lots of different combinations we can do in this group, but V or Y contains both A's and B's. So it can contain, maybe V contains that, or maybe V contains that, or Y contains a, a group of A's and B's, or some sort of combination like that when we break up our string. What happens when we make copies of that? Our string will not follow the format of having a group of A's, then a group of B's, and a group of A's, because once we make a copy of this, we introduce a new AB substring in there, and there can only be one AB substring in our word, and there can only be one BA substring. So these two groups are the only two ways that we can split up this string. Um, either V and Y contain solid letters, or um, both of them contain solid letters, or the other option, one or both, contain mixed letters. 
If they contain mixed letters, we're not going to have the right format. And since there's only two, V and Y, that can get pumped, we can only keep two of these the same. So there's no way I can pump this. Because I cannot pump it, it is not context free. So here's this proof all written out. If A to the N, B to the N, A to the N is context free, then we must be able to pump it according to the pumping lemma theorem for a context-free languages. When choosing our substrings of words that follow this format, there are only two kinds of choices we can make. V and Y can contain solid letters, like all A's or all B's. But this can't be pumped because only two of the letter groups can maintain the same number of letters. The third one is going to get left behind. Now we can maybe choose the, the two outside ones or these two ones or these two ones, but no matter what, one group is gonna fall behind and not maintain the same number of letters. So um, it will not have the correct number, uh, the correct number of letters. So I probably need to put of letters on that. Now our other choice is that V or Y or both of them contain A's and B's. Now, if one of those contains A's and B's, when we pump it, we're going to introduce too many AB or BA substrings to have words of the correct format. So there are no other choices for us to choose how to split this up. They're either going to fall into this group or this group. So we can't pump it no matter what. Since we can't pump it, this word is not context-free. Now, the good news with these, uh, with this uh, pumping lemma theorem for um, context-free languages is it is a little bit more complex, but by writing kind of proofs with these two big general choices, almost all of the proofs that you have to write in this class can use pretty much the same uh, proof, which just maybe a few slight modifications like maybe if you have to prove that 3a to the n, b to the 3n, you'd probably have to put 3n down there, but the proof's gonna follow the same logic pretty much. Another thing might be that there is an extra letter, like four letters here. So you will have to modify that a little bit, but there's still only these two main choices for breaking it up into substrings. Now, the last thing I'll tell you before we leave is it is worth it to look in your book um, on the proof for this uh, pumping lemma theorem for context-free grammars. To show you a diagram of um, a context-free grammar in Chomsky's normal form, and they'll show you how that uh, diagram eventually generates the U, V, X, Y, and Z uh, substrings, and why this um, the pumping lemma theorem for context-free grammars is true.